The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. All right, we're in Acts 17, and we're in a series of, I don't know how many more lessons, not too many more lessons on this series that I'm doing on missionary evangelism, concerned about both home and foreign missions and what, what all the responsibilities that go with it. And um, I'm with Paul. We're on Paul's second missionary trip, and um, this is... Uh, I meant at, we're at Athens in Archaea. We're in Athens, and I'm in Acts 17, and I'm going to do three lessons. This is the second of three lessons from uh, Paul's sermon from Mars Hill. I'm in verses to, to I think, I think I've got, I don't know. I don't know how many more lessons I'm going to do, but anyhow. I'm in, I'm in Acts 17, and I'm in verses uh, 30 through 34. And I want to deal with this phrase that's in here, the time of ignorance. The time of ignorance. So pay attention to that. Uh, the times, well, that's plural, times of ignorance. I didn't put plural on it. Uh, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance... God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent. So this is a pretty big deal, this times of ignorance. Because he has fixed, and because it's very important to this time of ignorance, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, we know the man is Jesus Christ, whom, and you'll see it in a minute, whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, others said, we will hear you again concerning this, and some men joined him and believed, and then mentions a couple of them uh, at the end of the verse. Now, I want us to focus on a, a, a period of history. The word times is chronos. It's where you get chronology from. And the word ignorance is not in the English, it, it might have a very variable. But this is not, this is the word for agnostic in the Greek, in the Greek language. And, and really what that means is without knowledge. A specific period in human history that God winked at humans without knowledge of his plan. But with the coming of Christ, with coming of the, with the incarnation of Christ, he comes into history and makes a big splash, right? Uh, by going to the, you know, by his presence, you know, the healing, all that stuff. And then he goes to the cross and dies buried and raised from the dead. We haven't had a religious founder like that. And listen, there, will be, there won't be another one like that until the Antichrist comes, which is our subject on Tuesday night. And there'll be another world splash. And the world will go nuts in the tribulation. But, but, so I want to focus tonight on this word, the times of ignorance that Paul, Paul uses. And, and I want to read that again. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now incarnation of Christ is now 
the incarnation, you know, the subject is, what, what turned them off on this preaching? The resurrection turned them off. So this is what this is about. God is now, now in this point of history, is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent because there's the next on the schedule of God's is judgment. Well, you've got to really understand that these Greeks that he's speaking to, they didn't believe none of that stuff. They didn't. They believed that all you got out of life is what you lived, and when you died, that was it. There was no afterlife. There was no judgment. There was nothing. So you better get it while you're here. Okay. The only joy and pleasure you're going to get is right here. Wouldn't that be sad? I think about poor old Dave Wisenant. Wouldn't that have been a sad idea if this was the best you're going to get? See, only healthy people think that that that, that. think about all the people that they don't they never get a good day. Right? I mean, just just can't, it's not possible. Well, anyhow. So let's have a word of prayer and then we're going to get into our our subject matter on this. This a, 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 a you know, probably nobody pays attention to it. But this is a pretty big deal here. The times of ignorance is a pretty big deal. So let's, let's have a word of prayer about this. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. This is classroom etiquette. You can't study the Bible. The unsaved doesn't understand it. It's they, a spiritual person. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. It's, it's that simple. It's not difficult. As a believer, if you're carnal, you can't understand it. You, you can't get it in the flesh. This is not about how much education you have. It's the ministry of the Holy Spirit to teach you the truth of the Word of God. Carnality, the evidence of carnality in a Christian's life is the awareness of personal sin. Unconfessed sin hinders the ministry of the Holy Spirit both in the study as well as the application of the Word of God to your life. So how do I correct it? First John 1 John 1.9 says to the Christian, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What's this do? Well, verse 5 says, put you back in fellowship. What is that? This is a passage of 1 John 1 John 1.9 is dealing with sanctification. It's not dealing with salvation. It's dealing with the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life that gives him dynamics, Di the, dynam the divine dynamics for his life. So, Confess your sin in silence through your priesthood of 1 Peter 2, and then let's, let's get the joy out of the scriptures tonight. Father, we're so thankful for these who have come our way by automobile and by internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God to us under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We pray as we look at this time in regard to missionary evangelism, what was this time of ignorance that God overlooked but now calls men everywhere? To repentance. And what is that? Tonight we'll discover it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, here we are. Uh, Paul's sermon from Mars Hill. Um, the whole sermon. You always pay attention whenever God records a whole sermon in the Bible. Right? Well, that's one of the things we've learned. You pay attention to it. Uh, Every, every, every Bible teacher should pay attention to it because it shows you how to, how, how to lay sermons out. You know, I went through homiletics and we never opened the Bible. We studied out textbooks. Well, we opened it once or twice, but I mean, nowhere near. We should have been studying sermons that God thought were good. Well, we did, we did study hermeneutics, but homiletics is the, the art of teaching, and then hermeneutics puts you, you know, all the technical background to it. But, I mean, when you find a whole, a whole sermon, you ought to study it. If for no other reason to see, to find out what, what God's intention is. I mean, he says, lays out a whole sermon. What's his bottom line? What's he after? How's he... How is, he, how is he speaking to me uh, through, an, through a pastor? 
uh, or a teacher or whatever. So for me, they're, they're just enormously important. And they should be to you if you find a whole sermon. I mean, well, we have one, of course, at Mars Hill. The whole thing is recorded from start to finish. Even the, even the, uh, the response to it was given. Uh, and the response to his sermon, Jesus tried to explain it to us in the parable of the sower. It's all about the response of the hearer. And so, you, you know, you always go in with a sermon or a Bible study like tonight, uh, w not necessarily thinking who's going to be there, but know that God's going to send people that have the ears to hear. And how they respond to that is very important. They all got ears, and they've all got interest, or they wouldn't be there. But the parable of the shower, sower says, whoa, now what happens? They, so all of this is kind of important. So during the Sermon on Mars Hill, Paul made a reference to the importance of the presentation of the gospel, the gospel of grace salvation, during the time of ignorance. And here's the verse, 1730. I read it twice to you, but here it is again. Now here's what the English does not show you that's enormous. The word therefore is, is, is a lot more than therefore, and the English struggles sometimes when you, what you have is the, is the word men, M-E-N, dash, un. And what you have, the word M-E-N, I got to explain a little bit, so just be patient in order for you to understand the dynamic. This is a lot more than therefore. You know, normally, therefore, you ask why for. Well, you can't do this with this. That's the word un, O-U-N. If you see that is translated therefore, then you say therefore is why for. This is not what that is. This has got men on the front of it, dash un, men un. The word men is what we call a particle of affirmation. And un is a, continuate, a continuative conjunction. Now, when the Greeks put that together, Paul being a master of the language, when he puts that together, he's put that together in order for you to understand, um, and I wrote it on your paper up here, a contrast for emphasis. In other words, we would highlight it. Uh, we would probably draw a circle around it. We might bold print it. We're going to do something with that, with that big, that's a big piece of information. I'm about to give you a big piece of information. You know, it, it, when I used to go to school, if the teacher, if she was about to, you know, reviewing and getting ready for a test, she would say, I don't know, but this could, could be very important for you later. Right? What a wonderful teacher she was, boy. I learned to write that down. I mean, how, why, she'd give you a whole bunch. I mean, if you paid attention, she gave you enough to get a C. God bless those teachers. That's how I got through. Uh, so, so we have this. And so what he's going to show you, and we have it in Athens, is he going to show you in this that there is a a, a a conflict and a contrast between two belief systems in the world. Two belief systems. And we got them in this, we got them at, at, at Athens. <clears throat> we got them at Athens. We've got one, one belief system that runs by God, that's divine viewpoint thinking, that's truth. We got another system run by the devil, that's cosmos diabolicus, and that's lies. They're absolutes. Divine viewpoint, absolute truth. Cosmos diabolicus, absolute lie. God can't tell a lie, the devil can't tell the truth. That's about as absolute as you get. <laughs> right? Now, at Mars Hill, we've got this. We've got one group of people that are, that are promoting a cosmos diabolicus. And they're identified in this passage, and we'll see it. They're identified at Mars Hill, these two groups. 
their philosophical view of the world and God are, are identified. And Paul steps into that with the message from God, which is the gospel, and declares truth about it. You understand? So we have, I mean, this, Paul on Mars Hill is like Elijah on, on the mountain, you know, with the, the prophets of Baal. It, I mean, it's, it's more 20, 21st century. I mean, everybody's got coats and ties. But Mars Hill is, is the same conflict. This is the same conflict. Polytheism versus monotheism. Cosmos diabolical is your divine viewpoint. Blah, 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 blah. So, and, and, of course, it's, it's a conflict throughout the whole Bible, isn't it? Why? Because of the angelic conflict. It's because of that. So this starts out by giving us a heads up. Men, the word, the, the word translated in English, therefore, gives us a heads up that this is a, 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 great, con, uh, a great contrast for emphasis. That's, what that, that's how you do that in the Greek language. Therefore, so he's established, he says, so he's given us a heads up what to look for in contrast. Having overlooked, this is made up of compound word. The word hooper, you know, we call it super in English. It, it means up and above, right? So we're very familiar with that in our, our culture. And then edun, edun is a, a form of the word horeo. It's a form of the word horeo. That's why it's called, watch this now, and it, it's a good translation in English, overlooked. Because horeo means to see or to look, and hooper means over, and so that's what this is. And this is re reference to God. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now. You understand? So this was, there was a period, a specific, and the word times, notice I put it, it's chronos. It has a definite article. That T-O-U-S is a definite article. That's the word the, but it's important in the Greek language. The times of the ignorance. See, there's another definite article over here, agnoia. See, that's where you get the word agnostic, right there. So we have tis, that's a definite article. That's the word the. So the times of the ignorance, all right? And so that's important. Now, again, for contrast, at Mars Hill, you've got Paul representing the message of God, which is divine viewpoint, which is absolute truth. On the other hand, you've got, you've got instead of having the Pharisees, you've got the Epicureans and the Stoics. And he identifies them. On the other hand, and you know what they were promoting? Listen. Their religion was idolatry. You remember when Paul went in? He said, I've never seen anything like this. And, and it's recorded historically, there were over, over 30,000 idols to gods in this city. Then they had this statue to the unknown, and Paul said, hey, I got this one. I got that one. But it's just interesting, and so... And here's what's interesting. Here's the contrast. You wouldn't that contrast because it's definitely, can you not see the contrast? At Mars Hill, you can't. Come on now. Now, here's idolatry. Well, let me go. Here's Paul. Here's what Paul, and he's going to talk about this, but here in Paul's sermon, here's what he's going to do. He's talking about God the creator who created man in what? His image. So, we have man, Paul represents man, created in the image or imagination, image imagination of God. Agreed? Genesis 1, 26, 27, right? Paul's going to say that. On the other hand, you got Cosmos Diabolicus that says that God, little g, is created by the image or imagination of man. That's idolatry. That's a definition of idolatry. See the contrast? This is war. This is war. I'll tell you something else. 
me show you how long this war has been going on before Paul got there. <laughs> Over 500 years. This is Satan's playground. He set up the whole educational system that, that controls the mindset of the Greek Empire and the Roman Empire. Over 500 years, this has been an established way of thinking. And they've developed it into a university concept. Huh? Paul is very familiar with this because he went through some of that. And Paul is going to quote some of their famous poets in, in, at, at this time. Just think about that. America, 200, listen, 500 years ingrained all the way through the Greek and through the Romans. Can you imagine that? And Paul comes in there and drops a bomb. Dropped a bomb. And listen, in his generation, said he's going to get cleaned up. You know how? The power of the gospel to change people's hearts. You couldn't have got rid of that out of that culture any other way, dear hearts. There's the power of the gospel. When Paul said in, to the Romans in 116, the gospel is the power of God and to salvation to everyone who believes. I don't know that we really believe that. I don't know that we believe that today. But the history of Athens, within his lifetime, he will see it changed. The power of the gospel. Gee whiz. Listen, you got people in your family. Don't you give up on them. You just keep preaching the gospel of the truth of God's word and love on them. And listen, if they open that door of faith, their life will be changed forever. And if they don't, then judgment will get them. But you've been faithful. Listen, if you know it changed your heart, you know it changed anybody's. That's what I know about it. Changed mine, boy. Change mine. Well, anyhow, see, see, I haven't left this whole concept yet of men no, men un. Do you realize that? I, I've been whacking away here for a while, and I haven't left that. That's how important that is. Uh, but now, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Metanoia. Noieo which means to change their mental attitude. In Athens, it means to change their mental attitude about the source of salvation, not idolatry and works, but Jesus Christ in grace. Right? The gospel, the gospel of grace. What a wonderful thing. These people, they're going to get saved and it cost them a penny and they're not going to believe it. Because all the work was done by Jesus Christ. You get saved by grace because he does the work. You don't get saved by works. You don't get saved by works and you don't remain saved because of works. Works come because you are saved. <laughs> the change of, that meta, meta is the word change and noia is the word for mind. Meta noieo is the verb and it means to change your mind about something that's within text. And in this text is to change your mind to the gospel, to, to, go, to step out of idolatry. Listen, and people that very day that heard it stepped out of idolatry into the kingdom of the beloved son. Do you realize that? Some people heard it and went, I got it. I got ears to, I got ears to hear. When they heard, they believed. And that's all it took. I want to talk about four things tonight about the times. It should be plural. The times of ignorance. And how important the presentation of the historical gospel of grace salvation is to that idea. 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Paul comes and he says something that's really important to this concept. He says, for he says, and he's quoting Isaiah 49, 8. He says, 
at the acceptable time, I listened to you, and on the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. How about that? I mean, I told you that day is coming. That day is here. You know what? how? Christ goes to the cross and dies. And the prophecy of the Old Testament that he would come and die on a cross, be buried and raised on the third day is fulfilled. And so we live in the day of the acceptance of the day of salvation. We live in the day of salvation. I mean, the historical significance, the historical significance. In Jerusalem, on the hill called Golgotha or Calvary, Christ died. He, 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 he died on that cross in our place, was buried and raised from the dead to give us life everlasting. Hoo-ah. Oh, jeez. If it doesn't get any better than that, I don't know. Point one. Note that the times of ignorance consist, consisted of two articulate nouns. Notice that they both have the. The times of the. That's very important, the Greek language. It shows that both of these are important. It's not, listen, he, listen in the Greek language, you can put the definite article on the front word and not on the second one, and it connects them. When you put a definite article on both ones, it separates them for you to discuss the times and the ignorance. Both are resolved. The times are no longer past. The time is present when you can hear the gospel and believe it and enter the kingdom because Christ has come. And the day of being without knowledge is over. We live in the day, we live in the day of salvation when the knowledge is free, free and open to those who believe. They refer, these words, times of ignorance, they refer to a specific period of time before the historical advent of Christ Jesus. The divine purpose the times of ignorance shows that the timing of the incarnation of Christ was crucial in the plan of God. It may not be crucial to you and I because we, we don't know enough. But after you begin to learn about biblical history and you see the timetable that God has, Christ comes, he leaves, the church comes, mystery. The church is taken Last seven years of Israel, then into the millennium, then great white throne judgment, then into a new Jerusalem. We're, we're there, the people. We are there. We are there. And the time of ignorance is over. Kaput, gone. Yeah. Yeah. So... Today, like 1 Timothy 50, Christ came into the world to save sinners, right? Christ came into the world to save sinners. Romans 5, 8, 9, John 3, 16 through 18. God so loved, sent his son where? In a crucial time of history. And when he did, and when he completed his task on earth, days of ignorance is over, buddy. The days of, we live in the day of salvation when it is well known. And he has sent all of us out as ambassadors to make sure that everybody understands it, right? Not one person in here is not, not called to be an ambassador of Christ. Every one of us is called. And all we have to do is tell them the story. What they do, it is their business. Me telling them is God's business. Right? I'm going to tell them the truth. What they do, with is their business. I'm going to tell them the truth. I'm going to tell them the truth. In the King James, this word overlooked in the English is winked. God winked. I do like that. Evelyn has, has just turned three. I hope she's watching. God love that, baby. But Evelyn just turned three. And she flirts. It's the darndest thing I've ever seen in my life. I'm, I'm serious. I mean, I know what flirting is. You know, I still remember it. <laughs> it. It's getting vague, but I remember it. And she flirts like crazy with me. 
She just, I said to her, I said to Angie, would you look at this? I, I'm serious, she flirts. I, I'm not making this up like a grandpa would. I, I said, you are, you are going to have your hands full. I mean, I, I don't know that she's three, she's two. That's, I don't know. How's that happen? Maybe other kids do it too, but not to me. <laughs> I told Angie, I'm feeling a little bit uncomfortable here. <laughs> no, I just, I just kidding with you. But not kidding about, I'm not kidding about flirting. I mean, she's, but anyhow, this, I got there from this word wink now. Don't get crazy. <laughs> um, every time I hear this word, I think about... Um, Simrose boy, you know, they called him Wink. I told Angie, it, it must must be another two-year-old that winked. I mean, I'm going to call him Wink. I don't know. I'll have to ask Bill. I have no idea. That's a strange name. Tag on a kid. God winked. Well, anyhow, God winked. God winked or overlooked. Overlooked is a good word for that. The times of ignorance regarding, listen, and he tells you in the next verse what, 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 the, Oh, he, he overlooked, listen to me, the time of judgment. Now, I'm going to tell you how important this is. You got your Bibles, haven't you? Look at, look at Hebrews 9.27. Look at Hebrews. I just want you to put your eyes on it because you will know it. You will know it. And so I want you to remember where it is because you know everybody in here knows this. When you looked at it, did you say, oh, yeah. <laughs> right? What's it say, Don? Yeah, and that's it, right? There we are, boy. What's next on the schedule, right? There you go, die of judgment. You know, they used to say death and taxes, right? As Christian, we say death and judgment, right? <laughs> uh, um, and what you got, what you've got is, a, listen, here's the key to this thing, that time of, uh, that time of thing. See, now we're talking about after the flood to the second coming of Christ. That time of ignorance? If there was one prior to it, it's been reinstated. It's been reinstated. You know why? Because it deals with judgment. And the coming judgment after Noah, then the next judgment, world judgment, is the second coming of Christ and by fire, not by water. Agreed? Yeah. See, that's the connection of that verse 31 in that text, right? From going from 30 where it says time, then it says the days of judgment. That's the connection. That's, that's really a big deal. So we, when you, let's say if you want to know more about this uh, day, day, the day of judgment that's coming as far as the world is concerned, you know, the renovating of the world, then you could read 2 Peter, 2 Peter 2 and 2 Peter 3. I put them on your paper. Now we live in the, uh, the, day, the day of salvation through the incarnation of Christ. Now God declares all men everywhere to repent. Uh, that's a present active infinitive if, if you don't know what those letters stand for. This repentance requires a change of mind for the, for, the Athen, for the Athenians from idolatrous works to the gospel of Christ as a source of grace salvation. And we're going to see at the end of this in verse 34, a couple of people get saved. Probably more than that, but two were recognized, right? Many, I think some, how they, some, some joined and believed, some. And they mentions two prominent people. Name dropper. No, I, <laughs> well, I know. every time I do it, it was a name dropper, and they were right. <laughs> and they were right. Clarity of both the message, I'm watch this now. Clarity of both the message as well as the mechanics of the gospel of grace salvation is necessary for grace salvation as well as necessary for divine judgment that's coming. Listen. You should give a clear gospel, both in the message and the mechanics. The message, Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. The mechanics, you believe, it's, it's, listen, it's by faith, so it, the work is done by grace. The work is done by God, therefore it's a gift. Second, you know, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, of course we know that. Well, 
See, what, what's important is that when you give a clear gospel, both in the message of mechanics, and I keep saying that because people don't do that all the time. They give a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And nobody knows what they got. You got to have a clear gospel, both in the message and, and listen. It's up to the person to believe it. It's up to the Holy Spirit to bring it into reality of their life and their mind. For them to understand and believe it, I can't possibly, I don't have the power to do that. It's not part of my responsibility. John 16 puts it on the Holy Spirit of God and on the Word of God. I am the messenger of it. I'm just an ambassador. I'm not, I'm not the man. I'm the ambassador of the man of Christ. And so, listen, I can walk away and listen. That message will be accountable at the judgment, at the great white throne judgment seat. That's why it's important for us not to lollygag and to give it to them, love on them, give it to them, and leave it. It will do its own work, and then it comes down to a decision, right? But clarity is important, prayer is important, loving on people is important, right? I mean, we can do all those things, but we can't convert them. We can't. Well, anyhow, when you read uh, Acts 17, I laid some key verses down there. It would be well free to go back and read through that chapter one more time and look at some key verses. There, that's not 1731. That's a 17 comma 31. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. God has set a day of eternal judgment in Revelation 20, and that's important. That's what Paul, Paul is talking about to them. You may not believe in judgment. You may not believe that there's going to be a great white throne judgment uh, deal one day, but it's going to happen. You will know that I told you the truth when you stand there, and it will be too late to do anything about it, dear heart. So you better do it today. That's, it. that's Paul's message. That's my message, and I hope it's yours. However, God's righteousness is imputed to every person who believes the gospel of grace salvation. Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He, God, made him Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, that divine purpose, we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's positional truth. You don't do anything to earn it. You don't do anything to get it. But once you got it, you got it. Once you got it, you got it. And how do I get it? I get it the moment I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have the righteousness of God imputed to me through his son, Jesus Christ, and I have it forever. It is sealed in the deal. It's called grace. It's called grace. Paul tells them, in, in, 17, in chapter 17, verse 31, if you go back and look at that, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through the man, Jesus Christ, whom he's appointed, having furnished proof. Listen to that. Furnished proof. Furnished proof. You know who's going to sit on the throne at the great white throne judgment? The one who sets in resurrection body. Whoa. Watch this. Having furnished proof, are you with me? To all men, all men, he's called all mankind now to repent. R repent and get, if you think there's another source of salvation, you better change your mind because there isn't. Christ is the only one. I am the way, the truth, and life. No one, no one, no one. I don't care who you are. No one. No one gets to the Father except through his Son. That's the deal. And you can take it or leave it, but that's the deal. Having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. There's your proof. God's proof that the believer of the gospel of grace salvation will not be judged at the great white throne judgment is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You're in the resurrection. If you believe the gospel, you are in his resurrection. You are in his resurrection. Well, anyhow, the second thing I want to share with you. 
that's the universal, the universal time of ignorance. Are you with me? And, and what, what does this apply to? I don't know if it applied to the other, but I know it applies to the post-Diluvian period. The post-Diluvian is after Noah's flood. You and I live in the post-Diluvian period of biblical history. We'll be in that period until the rapture of the church as far as we're concerned, and the rest of them have to go through the tribulation before we get to the millennium. All right. But I want, I, want you, I want to take this out of the universal idea of the time of ignorance, okay? And I want to bring it into a personal capsule. I want to bring it down to Ron Adema. What does time of ignorance mean? What did that mean to me, right? What does it mean to, you know, the guy in the corner, standing on the street corner. The personal time of ignorance, this is what I believe now, the personal time, not the universal time, right? Personal time. The personal time of ignorance occurs between God consciousness and gospel hearing on a personal level. I was thinking about this. I can remember clearly. Now, my people weren't, you know, we're not religious as we think it. We're farm people, so we believe in God. <laughs> well, we, we covered all of our bases. Um, but I can remember as a five, six-year-old kid thinking about a God of supreme being, and, and my people called him God. I'd look up in the sky. I'd lay out on the, I'd lay out on our front lawn in the summer. It's the only time you could lay on a front lawn in the north in the summer. Uh, about one month out of a year. And I would look up into the sky and I would see all these things that I would think, by there's got, I mean, who created all that? And, you know, you could look and you could see a man's face on the moon and all that, right? Yes. And, and my grandma would say, that's him looking back at you. And so he'd be a good boy. And I went, <laughs> I said, well, the good thing, I only have to be a good one at night. Because I didn't see none in the sun. So you got to be careful how you tell me. I did think that way. I said, well, hey, it's just I'm okay in the daytime. It's at night I have to watch my PC, which is pretty good. The Bible says that, doesn't it? Old lamb, full moons. Well, there you go. Well, anyhow, I, I thought about that. I think, I, and I really believe that. I think there's a personal time of that, the personal, the personal time. And, and listen, here's what I know. I know that the devil is active during the, this time of ignorance in a person's life. He's very active. If you think he goes to sleep on a job, you can forget it. Jesus, I think Jesus taught this doctrinal principle in the parable of the tares. In Matthew, the 13th chapter, verses 24 through 30, he gives you the parable of the tares. I, I forget what the King James called it. The parable of the, um, well, anyhow, par, it wasn't a parable of tares. But anyhow, there, there's a parable, not the parable of the sower now, there's a parable of the tares in that same section of the parable of the sower. But, but anyhow, there's a parable of the tares, and then it's one of the, it's in Matthew 13, Jesus gives two parables and explains them because nobody could understand them. So he told you how to understand parables. So he gave an explanation of the parable of the sower, and he gave an explanation of the par parable of the tares. Are you with me? So I want you to turn in your Bibles. I'll never get through this study anyhow. <laughs> because I'm going to get you out of here on time. So I'm, I'm such a time-oriented guy. I'm going to get you out of here on time. I look at 13. Then let's go to 36 through 43. Matthew 13, 36, 43. You got a pencil? Got a pencil? If not, well, just poke and get some blood. Use your finger. Uh, and fill in what the answers are. He says, he says, the field, the sower, the good seed, the reapers, the tares, the enemy, the harvest, and the ears. Are you with me? Now, look, as you go down there, look. He tells you what the world is, right? I mean, the field. <laughs> What's the field? The world. the world, okay. The sower. Who's he say the sower is? Nope. Who's he say the sower is? It's right there. The Son of Man. You know who that is? That's Jesus Christ. Who are the good seeds? Who are the good seeds? I said who? 
Who are the good seeds? The sons of the kingdom. Sons of the kingdom, right? Sons of the kingdom. Now, you're going to have to look down a little ways. Who are the reapers? I want to have four on each side. <laughs> the angels, the elect angels, they're the reapers. Are you with me? 36 to 43. Who are the tares? Sons of the evil one. Who's the evil one? The devil. He's, you know, one of his names is evil one. Who's, who's, the, who's the enemy? The devil. What a surprise. The devil. What's the, what's the harvest? What, pay, pay attention now. What's the harvest? Mm-mm. Uh-uh. It's not the end of the world. If it says that, it's not true. Yeah. It's the end of the age. It, it's not the end of the world. It's the end of the age. It, it's technical, but it's, 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 I mean, he's talking to a Jewish audience. Yeah, the end of the age, it's an ion. It's the end of the age. And then look at, now, I, I want you to do a little something. Now, you got it filled out, right? The end of the age. If you want to, if your Bible says end of the world, you can put it down there because that's what your Bible says. And, but just understand, it's also the word of it's word of age. Now, look at 13.9. Look at 13.9. Now, watch what he says. Now, this is where this whole thing starts. Now, he's going to give parables. The whole chapter 13 is parables. Agreed? It's one parable after another re as recorded. Not necessarily as way spoken, but as recorded. Are you with me? Now, listen. Listen to me. I'm going to say this because I said this one time. I said I would never say this again. I know. But I'm going to go ahead and do this anyhow. Listen. You know you have both your ears. Right? You've got, you, you have ears, plural. I said from now on I would say, I want you to touch your ear because I said ears one time and a, and a guy thought I excluded him and he took it personal. And because he only had one ear. And uh, I felt so bad because he had lost it in a crash or something. But who, what are the odds? So, I mean, I really felt bad. I, I left there. I, just, I felt just terrible about it. And so I said, I'll never do that again. I'll make people I said, just grab your ear. And I went, well, just read the Bible and let it go. Right? Just, why do you do any of that? Just read the Bible and let him, let him fuss. Don't let him fuss with you about it. I mean, <laughs> well, I don't, I'm not criticizing a poor man with only one ear. I have to tell you that. But listen to what he says. Now my ears itch. <laughs> my head's starting to scratch. <laughs> I'll have you all itching here in a minute. Oh, jeez. I go on vacation for a couple of days, and I lose my mind. Uh, uh, he who has ears. What? Let him hear. Right? Let him hear. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, this is, and here's how he starts, right? And now, now he, because you really got, sometimes you really have to, and what are ears? I, I, don't, I know they're to hear and all that. I'll tell, you what, I'll tell you what they really symbolize, though, is volition. Because, he, you know, he could have said have ears, and you go, like, what are they for? Ben can tell you what ears are for. Uh, then when he gets 13, he can just, he's learned how to turn them off and all that. <laughs> like a radio, he can turn them on, turn them off. <laughs> ah, right? All my kids did, anyhow. Listen, he who has ears should do what? Hear. Ought to listen. He's talking about volition. Listen, and here's Paul's idea at, at Athens. Listen, God wouldn't have sent me here if there weren't ears to hear. If there wasn't positive volition, I wouldn't be here. You've got to have positive volition for God or the gospel, and I'm here to find out which one because I'm going to talk about God. I'm going to give the gospel. I'm going to give an invitation. We'll find out how that works. 
Because God don't send you where there's not positive people. He just don't do it. And listen, they're going to be open to hear the gospel. Now they may shut down. That's not my business. Right? That's not mine. Look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. I love the way he does this. Listen to what he goes. Listen to what he says. Blessed are your ears because they hear. Is that how yours reads? Something like that? Well, it does. It says eyes and ears. Give me a break. I, some blind man in here, and then I'm in trouble. I mean, I'm in trouble with ears that don't need to be. And then it'll be people with arms and legs and all that. I can't go all there. Blessed are your ears. I went to the ears because I have them. No, <laughs> I have them in my text. Bless. Oh, boy. Wouldn't you know that probably everybody in their thing, I think I'll listen to Ron tonight. <laughs> well, anyhow, Athens, Athens is an example of the devil. And here's my point. Athens is an example of the devil's activity during the times of ignorance. I said it earlier, the devil sowed tares in Athens some 500 years before Paul showed up. Think about that. You think that guy's slack on his job? We may be slack on ours, but he's not slack on his. I'll tell you why. Because he understands the emergency of time. Even his demons understood it. When, they, when Jesus would show up, they would go nuts. Now, I'll tell you, if anybody, if, if, they're, if the slugs understand it, guess what the top guy knows? Second Corinthians 4, 4, in whose case the God of this world, the devil, has blinded the minds of the ones who don't believe, the unbelieving ones, so that they might not see. See, here's that, here's that period in there from God conscious to gospel hearing, that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Isn't that something? You know, and, and he means image of de deity. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's what he meant, didn't he? Mm. Here's point three. There were two different types of idolatrous tares uh, sown in Athens. Epicureans and Stoic philosophies of Cosmos Diabolicus. And what's interesting is my pastor used to, my hands, I may have to have a girl do this. Where's Evelyn when I need her? <sighs> Couldn't get the top off. Can you believe that? Got to go back to the gym, don't I? My hands are sweaty. Are you sweating tonight? Nope. I must be in trouble. <laughs> my pastor used to put that on the board. And he would, he would, it was a diagram of the old sin nature. And, and this is this two group of people. He would say the old sin nature has a trend up here and has a trend down here. If you know anything about human nature, you know this is true too. In your own family. It's amazing to me how you can have four kids and, well, anyhow. It's amazing me you can have four kids, right? Uh, lasciviousness and asceticism, ascetic. Lascivious and ascetic. And boy, we got them here. The Epicureans, they were lascivious. Their whole doctrine was it. Every bit of their doctrine was lascivious doctrines. And the Stoics were ascetic. All their doctrines were ascetic. So, and they called them philosophies. They didn't call them philosophies. In Acts 17, 18, it talks about the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers conversing with Paul. Some were saying, 
what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others were saying he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus in the resurrection. In verse 32, they're identified. Three groups of hearers. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of Jesus, some began to sneer. Others said, I want to hear more. The ears. The Epicureans taught there was no life, no life or judgment after death, like in, like in Hebrews 9.27. They would go, not, no. They taught the only pleasure was fulfilling desires of the flesh. That's what you live for. Uh, Luke 12, 19, Ecclesiastes 11, 9. Physical death brought an end to the pursuit for the pleasures of the flesh. That's a hedonistic idea and lascivious trends of the sin nature. They rejected immortality, resurrection, and eternal judgment. The Stoics, however, believed the same about, about immortality, resurrection, and judgment. Their beliefs differed from the others based on ascetic trends of the sin nature. Therefore, they promoted a life of virtue, duty, law, and ethics. They would emphasize this rational morality over fleshly desires, for example. The gospel would seem foolish and unnecessary and, unnecessary, and Paul an idle babbler to both groups. Paul addressed this same problem to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 through 3 and to the Romans in chapters 1 and 2. Now in closing, Paul warned the Athenians, all inhabitants of the earth will be judged. Whether you like it or don't. <laughs> this, uh, he didn't say that, but he... He told them the truth. What, they all believed they would die. Where did that idea come from? Right? <laughs> where, did, where did that idea? Well, you know, it's just part of life, death. Yeah, where did death come from? Right? Sure, we know it. Yeah, we know it. But they didn't. They just believed it. Well, life came from the gods and... We just make the best of it, and when we die, that'll be it. Nothing could be far more there. He said, all inhabitants of the earth will, will be judged by the righteous standard of Jesus Christ declared by the gospel of grace salvation. He declares that in Acts 17, 31 to 34. And some go like, like me when I heard that. Oh, wait, there's a judgment coming? I'm in. <laughs> Put my name down. Did you got my name? Make sure you got my name right. A, a Ron, a, a, a to my. You Make sure you get all this right. We are reminded in the parable of the sower, the hearers, and listen, never worry about who's, who's there that you're speaking to. Don't try to figure them out. Don't try to anticipate or outguess them or, well, I wonder who will be there. I'll design a sermon just for that person. Don't do that. I mean, that's just foolishness because there's always four types of hearers when the gospel is preached. That's the point of the four grounds he who has ears to hear in Matthew 13. Therefore, and listen, for your homework, you would do well. Because you think you know this, you probably don't. I'm just, listen, you probably, oh, you know there are three types of, there are four grounds and people have ears and they but listen, when you go home, you go back and you read that. Your wife does hers and you do yours and see if you can hit the same point. You should be able to look at the same thing and get the same answers, right? Well... Let me tell you, his disciples couldn't. So we had to explain it. Twelve of them took the test and didn't get it. They flunked. So I'm just saying, 
do this test. What is the roadside? What is the rocky? What is the thorny? What is the good? You think you know? I doubt it. I will tell you, there's a clue to three of them because they all have the same word, receive. So I'm going to give you a heads up clue because you'll miss it. I know you'll miss it. So let me encourage you. Do that little test. And maybe call a friend and say, hey, you was at, you was at Wednesday night study. Did you do your little test? Let's compare. Let's compare and see if you come up. Should you not come up with the same, same answers? You should. I mean, the parable is there. Just saying. His, this, all of his disciples, hand-picked guys, flunked. You know how I flunked? He had to explain it. He had to explain it. And then they gave, he gave them the second parable. They flunked. He had to give them interpretation. He didn't do the th third and fourth and fifth one. He, kept, I just, he just quit. No, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just saying. You, sometimes we think we know what we don't know. A wise man knows that. Just saying. The wise man knows. He doesn't know all the time what he thinks he knows. That's why he's a wise man. Well, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your love, mercy, and grace. We thank you for each person that's come our way by automobile and by internet. And I pray that people would take what I teach serious. They can leave the antique someplace else, but for sure the truth, the truth has set you free, for sure. And I pray that we would study the things that have been taught, come to, our, come to a decision within our heart under the ministry of the Holy Spirit of what is true, and that which is true will set us free from just craziness in our minds. Begin to put doctrine upon doctrine and clarity upon it in our life so that we can live out our life of faith, that we can walk by faith, not just learn by it, walk by it, live by it. Grace is a powerful idea, and it works through faith. Grace. So we pray, Father, that the clarity of the message tonight, the clarity that the study of it, the ministry of the Holy Spirit to give us clarity within our soul would be attached to this lesson in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him.